like to welcome you all here tonight to tonight's roundtable event. Um, tonight is jointly sponsored by eLaw, uh, Lawyers Weekly and my company, which is uh, Experts Direct. For those of you who don't know, Experts Direct provides expert witnesses for litigation. Lawyers Weekly is one of Australia's leading legal publications, and eLaw is leader, uh, leaders in digital evidence. In my business, and as well as, well as eLaw's business, we're constantly getting inquiries from uh, class action lawyers, and there, we've seen that there are sort of many issues that are facing them and, and, and the industry. So we thought it would be a great idea to have a roundtable discussion on, on, on the uh, topic tonight. So we also noted that the Lawyers Weekly covers a lot of topical issues as well, so hence we uh, got the Lawyers Weekly involved. So as this is my first function that I've assisted in organising, uh, I surveyed a number of lawyers and um, I asked and asked them what makes a good roundtable event. So we got a few questions from the from a uh, few lawyers, but I think there was an uh, overwhelming majority that uh, what makes a good function is a good drop of red. So I think we've got that covered here tonight, um, and also we've got a great, uh, great panel of speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our chairperson of the panel tonight, which is the Honourable Justice Kevin Lindgren. He really no, needs no introduction, but Kevin Lindgren was a judge of the Federal Court of Australia from 1994 until he reached mandatory age for federal court judges, mandatory retirement age for federal court judges in February 2010. At the time of his appointment to the court, he was practicing as a Queen's counsel for the Sydney Bar, mainly in the area of commercial law. Dr. Lindgren was also acting judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and acting judge of appeal of the New South Wales Court of Appeal from 31 May 2010 until 3 September 2010. He is conjoint professor at the University of Newcastle and adjunct professor of law at the University of Sydney and the University of Technology, Sydney. After serving articles of clerkship from 1957 until 1962, Dr. Lindgren practiced as a solicitor from 1962 to 1969 he was lecturer, senior lecturer, and professor of law um, at the University of Newcastle from 1969 to 1984, and practiced at the bar in Sydney from 1984 to 1994, being appointed to Queen's Council in 1991. While he was a judge, Dr. Lindgren was president of the Copyright Tribunal of Australia from 2000 to 2007. Dr. Lindgren is author or co-author or the editor of several books and numerous journal articles and conferences and papers in the area of commercial law. He has continued to pursue, pursue such writing um, activities as well as undertaking mediation and arbitration work in his retirement. Dr. Lindgren was made an Order of Australia in the Australian Day Honours List in 2012 in recognition of his service to the judiciary and administration of justice through the Federal Court of Australia and to the legal education in the area of commercial law. So please, ladies and gentlemen, don't upset the judge tonight and please turn off your mobile phones, otherwise you might be thrown out. Um, we'll, 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 I'll hand it now over to Justice Lindgren. First, before um, any of the questions are put or answered, can I just tell you a little bit about the panel? And I'll uh, do these introductions in alphabetical order, my surname. John Emery, on my right, uh, is a senior partner in the global disputes practice of the international law firm Jones Day. He leads its class action practice and major claims work in the Australian region. John is a defence side class action specialist who has advised on a large array of class action issues over the last 20 or more years, mainly in the Australian class action context, but also with some US or global connections, spanning shareholder claims, structured financial products, government claims, environmental impact, and product liability matters. Um, he co-chairs the class actions committee. I, when I read that, I immediately looked down to see whether Ben Slade had said the same thing he did, because Ben is the co-chair with John of that same uh, committee, um, of which I'm a member. Uh, of the Law Council and uh, has guest lectured at a number of universities on class action litigation 
has produced many papers and spoken at countless conferences on this subject. John is also a member of the Law Council Litigation Funding Committee and a well-known commentator on funding issues. Now, I'm going to add in here that um, John is a noted portrait painter, and last year his painting, uh, the portrait was in the uh, final of the Archibald Prize. I happen to know that because there was a conference in um, uh, Melbourne where he was uh, speaking and it was announced that he had to absent himself momentarily from the conference and people said, why, why, why? I was just waiting to get the result of the Archibald Prize. Uh, so uh, in addition to all his other accomplishments, a painter uh, of some accomplishment. Ben Slade is the Managing Principal of Morris Blackburn's New South Wales practice and head of the New South Wales class actions team. Some of Ben's significant class actions include a shareholder class action against the AWB uh, settled in March 2010 for $39.5 million, the fourth largest settlement achieved to that date in a shareholder class action. A class, a class action against Amcor and DZ for over 1,600 businesses claiming compensation for victims of Australia's largest price-fixing cartel. This matter was settled in March 2011 for $120 million and was the largest ever settlement on an Australian cartel class action. A class action against Oz Minerals for shareholders that settled in May 2011 for $120 million. This was the largest ever settlement. I'm sorry. Uh, May 2011, 35.1 billion plus costs. A shareholder class action against New Farm that settled in September 2012 for $43.5 million and two current class actions that claim for compensation for hundreds of Australians who have faulty hip implants and defective knee implants manufactured by the pig. Um, and finally, two class actions against cash converters that claim millions of dollars for thousands of New South Wales consumers whose claims were overcharged on their loan contracts. Ben worked for 10 years for Sydney's Redfern Legal Centre, was on the Council of Law Society of New South Wales from 92 to 95, and was General Law Manager of Legal Aid New South Wales for six years before joining the Class Actions Department of Morris Blackburn in 2000. Ben was a board member of the New South Wales Public Interest Advocacy Centre for eight years until 2012. He's a board director of choice, and as I said, he's co-chair with John Emery of the Law Council's Class Actions Committee. He's also chair of the Law Council's Litigation Funding Working Group and a core member of the Law Council's Federal Court Liaison Committee. So that's Ben second on my left. Um, Alison Stanfield. Uh, of evil on my far right, is an expert and pioneer in the field of di digital evidence. She was one of the first to recognise the analysis of electronic filing vis a vis hard copy as the way of the future in legal, the legal profession and court litigation. Uh, she thought that almost all evidence is created digitally, and yet existing court rules on evidence apply to paper documents only. For the past 15 years, she has built an expertise in electronic discovery, computer forensics, and electronic trials as founder and CEO of eLaw, a specialist e discovery, secure online data rooms, and electronic forensics. Alison has been sought to provide expert opinion on the use of technology during, uh, during discovery to minimise costs. Um, interesting to note that. Alison was registrar of the Queensland Court of Appeal in the mid 1990s. I hadn't been aware of that. And that exposed her to technology initiatives, most notably the Council of Chief Justice and Electronic Appeals Project. The recommendations were adopted by the uh, Superior Courts and are widely used, including medium neutral citations. I think I'll move rather quickly uh, through some of the other accomplishments of. Alison, she's currently taking up a PhD in the authentication of electronic evidence at the Queensland University of Technology, where she obtained a Bachelor of Laws and Master of Laws. She was a recipient of the QUT Outstanding Alumni Award in 2011 and teaches electronic litigation, a postgraduate law subject she developed. She regularly writes uh, for law journals and speaks at legal conferences, and her 
the skills and achievements in digital evidence and her nomination for the Telstra Business Women's Awards in 2008. John Walker is very known as a speaker at gatherings of this kind. Um, John is Executive Director of Bentham IMF Unit, that is based in the Sydney office. John's educational qualifications include a Bachelor of Laws from Sydney University in 1985, together with a BCom from Melbourne with majors in Accounting, Economics and Commercial Law. With over 10 years prior experience in commercial education, John has developed some highly specialised skills over the last 10 years in providing funding for and managing insolvency, commercial, and multi-party litigation. Being instrumental in the formation of IMF, John provides innovative and progressive direction for IMF, together with material involvement in case selection and management on a daily basis, striving for the best outcome for every funded matter. And finally, Justin Wheeling, on my far left, has been the editor of Lawyers Weekly magazine since June 2011. In that period, he has helped to establish Lawyers Weekly as Australia's leading online legal publication. As a legal journalist, Justin has wrote on many of the most important stories affecting the legal profession over the past few years, including the arrival of Clinton Chance in Australia, the plans of Vincent Masons to launch an Australian practice and the launch of best practice guidelines for the legal profession by the Christian Jepson Memorial Foundation in May last year. Well, that is the introductions. Um, and we'll move now to um, the first question that I wish to put. Uh, I'll put this to John Henry, mainly because he said to me he didn't want to be the first one to be asked the question. Um, the um, question I'll put John for, is this. From a defendant's perspective, what are the major reforms of the class action regime that you would like to see happen? Sure. Okay, can you hear me well enough? All right. Um, also, that's a very a big question, and obviously topical as well. But perhaps I could try and segment the, the analysis um, in this way. Um, I, I would like to see reform in respect of break it down to three areas. The first area would be um, around procedure. Um, I think there's a number of significant procedural reforms we can, we can invoke to improve the system. Um, I, I think the tests are all soft to start the actions. Um, but, uh, and, and people have been talking recently um, extensively around certification, uh, including um, for my partners last week in the, in the press. Um, on the US style certification. Yes, that's, that's an important concept to consider. Uh, for me, I think other areas like common questions. I think one of the big things we don't do well in class action litigation is to find the common questions with sufficient clarity and, and in a meaningful way. Um, and that's been a problem in a couple of cases that uh, have been to that end of the process. So. You know, settlements, I would, I would make some changes around um, that process as well. But procedural changes is a range of the other changes around substantive law. I'm not for the, um, not for a moment satisfied that we are really dealing with that at all. Uh, take shareholder class actions. There are so many major questions outstanding. We don't really know the causation test that's to be properly applied for a shareholder class action and tens of millions of dollars are spent on these cases. And we don't know. And even if we got a decision today, that would be the first instance we would want to appeal. And no one's going to be satisfied until it goes through to you know, a proper appellate review of this whole process. That could be years away. Um, it seems to me there is a, a case for some statutory clarification of what the test should be. Same for damages. We don't really know what the damages tests are to apply in those sorts of cases, and that's an incredible um, gap in my view. So procedure, substantive, and the other area, if we don't talk a lot about, but we should, is execution. Um, and we have a, a practice note, C in 17 in the Federal Court, which uh, Kevin Lindgren, uh, he's dropping many of the things, he actually wrote this practice note, um, which 
Council's the early engagement between the parties to clarify issues, to talk about the scope of discovery, to really wrestle with those things at an early stage. And yes, some of these things you can't do at an early stage, but there's a lot more that we can. And management of the case, the execution at the management stage, and I don't mean to be critical of the court, but these cases are enormous. And I don't think that a single judge outcome running over these cases is really the right way forward. If you imagine some of the big cases going through the court right now, you imagine if they get a long way into the process, there's been tens of millions of dollars spent on these matters, and then the judge gets hit by a, a car or has a heart attack, or you know, we don't want that to happen. But it may happen, and it can happen in any big litigation, yes, I accept that. But you know, in this area, we're here to about class actions, and it seems to me that we need to actually reform of the way in which the courts tackle these cases. So I've got a, a, a few things across a range of areas there that may lead to some questions or comments from the, the audience. I do have one. Uh, the, one of the ideas, as John's mentioned, behind that practice mode was that there should be er, early, and at least in my concept, informal uh, conference opportunities to identify the issues. Speaking for myself, I had in mind that that conference would not take place in the courtroom, but in a room adjacent to the court, uh, with the judge and the party's legal representatives. And at an early stage, they would seek to thrash out the question of what are the issues and what is the fastest way forward. Now, um, obviously, I thought that was a good idea. I never had the opportunity to use it in a class action, but I had used that mechanism in a couple of other complicated proceedings, and it seemed to work quite well. But my understanding from talk around the traps is that it has not been used either at all, or not much anyway, in a class action context. Uh, I'd be interested to, um, well, first of all, to get confirmation. I think that my understanding is correct. Yeah, well, very much. I think mean, Ben may have a view on that too, because we, we discuss this quite regularly. Federal Court's practice note says that on the first directions hearing there will be a case management conference, and yet that's never happened um, in any of the cases that I've commenced. And look, there aren't that many cases we commence as one of the furfies that's been going around from the US Chamber of commerce that there's this enormous explosion in class actions and they're happening everywhere. Well, it's just not true. There aren't that many. Um, but look, admittedly, admittedly um, me and my mates are running most of them. Um, and when we start them, um, we don't get a case management conference first up. We tend not to get it second up after about a year and a half of really irritating interlocutory skirmishing. We plead for a case management conference and then get um, a, a, a thing that's organised with transcription and it is a bit more informal. We've had a couple um, relatively recently and it's, it is definitely the way forward. I think probably not at the first return. At the first return, the defendant's still trying to work out whether you're serious or not and working out whether or not it's worth even defending or whether it's a strikeout or some other um, interlocutory procedure is going to be going forward. And really, these cases are complicated. The allegations are complex. It's too much to ask them to come to the first directions here and be in any way thoughtful in the process, but maybe the second or the third <coughs> could be properly held in um, a room off the court one relatively recently in a product liability action was um, in on, I think it's level 18 of the federal court in a, a large meeting room um, with transcription and everyone was there and you could get a chance to speak, but um, I didn't. I met the senior counsel who was speaking. Um, but it, it, there was fairly um, clear and free ranging conversation on a number of issues that could have been a year and a half in the like, battles were resolved. That's a good thing to do, but maybe not straight yeah. Thank you. Any comments from the audience on that idea of an early, or fairly early, um, case management conference in an informal setting? I, I think the way it's supposed to work, and Colin, it's a really interesting observation. I think the way it's supposed to work is that you will have the senior members of the the team and the senior members from the, um, the partner and the senior representatives from the, uh, the defendant and plaintiff firms there. Um, I mean, there's a really live debate around whether in fact these 
these meetings should be recorded at all. And of course, the natural position that you start with is yes, they should be. But I, I wonder, I mean, to be frank, I would like to see, I've been a bit provocative tonight, but I frankly would like to possibly see these meetings occurring without any recording. Um, I think there'd be much more free flowing discussion. Um, I did two things at the moment. I, I, apart from running the things of class actions, um, uh, oversight of class actions being run by others. And the one problem that I've seen in the last three or four years in particular uh, in doing those roles is, is the cost uh, concerns around discovery and just the, for me that's the biggest problem and the biggest issue to get across in these early conferences. Um, obviously the plaintiffs want to get to the key records as quickly as possible and they assume you have a file set on the shelf that says knowledge of this lead conduct or you know, here's, the, here's all our file notes in relation to computer exposure. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. I'll come back to that. Um, and of course, as you know, the problem with these knowledge-based cases is the knowledge is fragmented and the case theory often tries to pick up someone's knowledge here and this person over here and this person over here and you add it all together and you get corporate knowledge, the corporate mind. Uh, so you know, no one structures their files to defend these claims in that way. Um, so the plaintiffs make wide-ranging requests. You know, it's a pretty blunt instrument to try and find the relevant files. Um, you're never really sure early on the piece where all the material is. You may have a, a client that's been particularly well organised, but what about the insolvent client where all, where all the uh, key personnel have been sacked or lost a long time ago. So it's difficult. Um, I would rather see a more informal discussion. Um, I would rather see that some rule reform that might actually lead to um, the uh, Chief Information Officer, the um, CFO, the CEO, the departmental head, whatever relevant people sitting around the table so there could be some, in fact, uh, and again, I'm not sound like a dependent lawyer here, but some even a deposition process I would be happy with to try and get some narrowing down, not just to the defendant's position, but also of any of any plaintiff records. Um, I think the quid pro quo for that, if the defendants are to proceed that way and, and I offer that offer that openness, should be that the defendants get better access to plaintiff material, not just of the representative party, which is usually a few documents, but of the class early information around trading data. That sort of material has been some of some applications for discovery. I think there's a trade-off there. I think there's a huge benefit if the, if the documentation focus early in the piece is very strong, the costs will come down and um, the case will move forward in a much more efficient way in terms of process and witnesses and so on. Um, and I've spoken a lot, so I should open the floor to others. But well, uh, Colin's comments are, are very interesting, but I just wonder, Colin, whether there is some benefit by in fact even more informality rather than rather than um, uh, taking it sort of back into the court. I think in Victoria bushfires, and I wasn't involved in that case, but I did hear the story that um, the judge actually tried to do the conference inside the courtroom. And maybe if somebody's here who's involved in that case, they could speak about that. Um, I'm just not sure that that leads to informality. I think it gives. It leads to formality. We've, we've had a circumstance where 20% or three of the last 15 of our class actions haven't involved the civil justice system. So in excess of $100 million has been paid by defendants without bothering the court. And, and this was achieved exactly in the way that's been spoken of, that you have informal disclosure of relevant information to either parties. Clearly, it can't settle until there is that that swapping of information. And if you have plaintiffs who are well uh, advised and, and properly represented, and clearly cannot settle claims unless they know enough about the value of their causes of action, and and also defendants who are prepared to accept uh, that there could be some wrongdoing, God forbid, then. Both parties can swap information, work out whether or not uh, litigation is necessary. It is clearly not necessary in all circumstances, and the non-adversarial approach of, of actually 
getting resourced and speaking about what issue is in dispute and what's in the interest of the parties uh, has uh, worked and, and uh, I think everyone can, can see the benefit of that. Could I just follow that up, John? That, that is a settlement in effect of a class action without, a, without an action, without yeah. proceeding. What I was wondering is how the defendant in that situation can be sure there's not going to be some further claim come out of the woodwork. In the court regime, with the closure of the class, you can ensure that all those who fit the description of the class are bound. But mm -hmm. uh, in your situation, doesn't the defendant uh, get worried that the defendant doesn't know that they're completely off the hook yet? Clearly, clearly there is no uh, limitation on, on that's provided under the rules outside the court. But that, and, 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 and I'm talking about 20 standard circumstances, so, so it's a, a lot will need that protection. Uh, and, and it's probably better for society to deal with, um, have an have a inclusive method of resolving disputes rather than an exclusive method agreed. So all, all that we've been involved in is an exclusive process for named claimants. Uh, but we've become pretty good at, at rounding up the big named claimants so that the defendant has to form a view as to whether or not there's enough rum left uh, for it to be worried about. And uh, if we've done our job well, and, and uh, then, then that's uh, uh, in their interest to a certain extent. Sure. If, 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 to give opportunity, you don't necessarily need to have an, an opt-out process in a court to give practical resolution. The defendants in one of those cases, in fact, uh, enabled the people to get involved if they wished to through their own uh, uh, records. And we, we weren't involved in that. We didn't get a fee for that. But whoever came in um, was involved in the settlement. And so they saw and, and took it under their own uh, per day to, to, to try and get a final resolution. Good. Interesting. So I'll turn to Alison. Uh, with this question, how does the use of technology during the discovery process increase efficiency, decrease cost, and add value to the preparation of parties' case? In particular, um, have class action lawyers embraced technology, uh, and how do you see technology assisting in class actions? Thanks, Josh. Yeah, obviously, I think technology really comes to the fore during discovery, particularly when you have a large number of documents and as we all know, almost all evidence today is created electronically. So the, the days of the nice manila folder, as John said, with everything in it, um, is long gone. It was and never there. <laughs> um, these days when lawyers ask their clients for anything that's relevant, you, know, you might get a blank book. Uh, but then it'll be, well, you know, we have emails and we have um, stuff on a file, up in a file server somewhere. Uh, if you're lucky, they may have a document management system. But what we find is that generally the evidence is spread across uh, a large number of places. Uh, so the first port of call is to say, well, you know, where is the evidence? Um, and then we can narrow that down with questions such as, you know, what's the date ranges that are relevant? Uh, who are the relevant people involved, and so the evidence collection becomes uh, more of a, a corralling exercise. Um, I, the next step in the process, obviously, is to then, um, I, I guess, try and just get the documents into a repository that are, I guess, potentially relevant, and then work with the legal team to identify uh, you know, those that potentially will make their way um, into, into evidence down the track. So the technology is improving all the time. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and, and in the old days, when evidence was still predominantly hard copy, it was scanning and data coding documents. Now, as I said, it's, it's all about obtaining electronic evidence in the first place, and you can really use the technology uh, to use the, the power of the content in those electronic records. And what I mean by that is, you know, as I said before, dates so that you can filter on date ranges, and but also searches, and I'm sure you all know the, the power of a keyword search. 
uh, but a keyword search can be somewhat limiting. Um, maybe you get more than what you're looking for, or you, you may miss things because you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, and technology really helps if you don't know what you're looking for. And the, and the technologies that we're looking at today um, analyze every word in every document, and then it can assist by uh, throwing up, I guess, pools of documents that are, that are of like concept um, or a similar subject. Um, to give you an example, we use a, a demo case that uses the Enron data set. And so if we uh, you know, put to the, to the data set um, a, a term such as fraud, it will come up with Arthur Anderson or off the books. Um, but it will also, um, if you look a bit more closely in, in, in the, the terms that are thrown back, it comes up with a number of um, uh, Star, Star Wars characters, which were some project names that were given uh, some of these things. So if you don't know what you're looking for, you may see Project Jedi and wonder what that's about. And if you actually go in and actually review some of the documents which have been corralled together, that may lead you down a train of inquiry um, potentially which you haven't considered before. So the benefits of the technology are that um, it allows lawyers to, I guess, cut to the chase a lot more quickly. Um, it means that uh, you know if you don't know what you're looking for, you can, again, cut to the chase more quickly. It brings documents that are similar together so that your review is done in a much more uh, in a much more targeted way, so you can get senior people looking at potentially relevant documents straight away and leave the potentially not relevant documents down the track or to more junior people. Um, so when you compare that to the old days of paralegals sitting there and going through documents one by one, you can see the, um, the, the, the time savings there. The, I think the major benefit though is once you've done that review and analysis and um, you know, as John mentioned before, you may have to try and piece together the evidence. So, you know, one person might be doing one thing and another person's doing another thing and then you've got, um, you know, documents that go to prove a number of different things. Well, the power of the technology comes into to the fore again there by allowing you to cross-reference uh, the workflow. Um, so, for example, we've got a case at the moment where there's um, many companies, many payments, many invoices, many bank statements, and they all have to be, um, the lawyers have to review those and put them um, against companies, payments, and so on. But if you can imagine having to do that in hard copy, you'd have to have numerous copies of everything. Um, different colour schemes, different post-it notes, and it would, you know, it can be a nightmare. The technology makes all of that really easy, and you can, again, see the cost savings there by really saving um, a lot of time. And I think it really allows you to get on top of your case much more quickly and much more effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions either from other panel members or from the audience in relation to electronic discovery or other use of technology? Well, I've got a comment. I'm not speaking too much on this issue. And I'll be keen to see if others share this view um, in their experience. The, the problem I see with, um, I don't really quite know the answer is, but um, again, coming back to discovery, some of the problems I've seen in looking at a range of cases now is, um, and I haven't fully appreciated this until the last couple of years, when we do a discovery project, um, and I've been involved in, we have a uh, the quality assurance process. So it would be very common for me to um, do a, we, we brought in a paralegal team to review documents and I'll talk about that issue. Um, seniority of review is, is an issue. But we would do a, a training session, um, we would go from the state of claim, um, there would be a training session around discovery. You know, everyone who does it has that list of lawyer group. Um, and there's a sort of pack they get given, um, a, uh, when they do the review process, um, uh, their QA to see if they're accurate enough um, to a certain percentage to start off with, and the good ones are kept, and the poor ones have moved on, and eventually that QA process tapers down over time. Um, but all that's trying, directed towards trying to give a reasonable response to the review of records. 
And I was talking with a plaint lawyer in a class action um, a couple of years ago about this, and I said, that's what I do. What do you do? And the answer was, well, we just keep pleading to the paralegals and say, just identify the relevant documents. And there's a disparity of um, quality um, in the response there. And I just wonder whether that's an area where we need to do significant work as a profession to try and set some benchmarks for how discovery is being performed. The other, and, and technology, technology is fantastic, but um, and, and with all of the stories when I first started, the big case was you know, an office full of papers. Um, then you know, the next generation big case would have been a room half this size and a room this size, and you know, HOH uh, came along and, and uh, all the papers laid side by side on HOH. Um, if you've done that, ran for 45 kilometres. I mean, who can read this? Uh, another recent one, two and a half million records. I mean, th these are impossible numbers. And technology and the complex searching that can be done now to try and filter and get to things. Um, in, in some ways, it's actually um, given us a reason not to tackle the problem because we're finding ways to, to make it possible to access all this like, electronic material. And it just seems to me some of the solutions around need to be worked on a bit more. One solution is don't give discovery. We've seen that in the Equity Division in Sydney. That's an extreme solution. Um, you know, defendants kind of like that usually. Um, but there's a lot more, it seems to me, that could be done around that issue. Um, we just need a lot more attention around the discovery stage of it. And I think also the other thing around, around quality of review. Um, and I guess one thing you see over the years is that the, there's no criticism on junior lawyers, um, you know, but when you review documents, um, it does tend to be the pattern of experience. And there's no criticism. But when people who are not really, really confident enough and don't have the experience to make the calls in the documents, so we tend to put into the discovery what someone more senior might leave out. And there's a cost-benefit balance, isn't it, to be achieved between those extremes. Um, and we need something better around that as well. Um, so, the, so the technology is fantastic. We would be dead without it. Um, but I'm just wondering whether it's giving us a soft, uh, a softness, and we're not really facing up to the problems that need to be faced up to. I mean, class actions. You know, these are the biggest discoveries around. Really, um, we need to do something about it. Well, one thing is to perhaps look at the need for discovery. I agree. Uh, it would be far better if the system created a process whereby there was no need for the plaintiff to ask questions to the defendant about, well, what, sh show, me, show me the documents that are important to this case. I mean, that, it could be as simple as that. Um, we have an adversarial system. We do not have an inquisitorial system. The question I raise is, well, in respect of discovery, why have you put the onus on the plaintiff? Why not have either the court look at the pleading and identify what ought to be provided and just keep it to a minimum and say that's what you should provide? Or the defendant have an obligation to the court, his, his agents, his officers of the court, um, or even the potential the, the... I mean, one of the problems with discovery is we both parties have to explain the issues in dispute to their lawyers, and the lawyers have to understand all of the facts and circumstances to work out what's relevant to the issues in dispute. So you have all of these people who weren't involved in the, in the original creation of the issues that are being uh, addressed in the process, who are trying to work out how, how do we deal with it. And, and, and perhaps I'm inviting uh, not, obviously, uh, uh, any mass reform in the civil justice system, but a way of potentially taking out the adversarial process involved in the discovery and trying to have onuses or obligations which are perhaps more efficient than this fishing expedition and this I have to go and trawl the ocean for all these documents. That's really in our in no one's interest. I'm a, I'm a big believer in the concept that uh, we probably need to make more cost orders against the plaintiff in relation to discovery in that. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me finish in, 
in, in that, I think there's a reasonable degree of discovery that can be requested. I mean, more often than not, because there's no real, I may say yes, we have to go through the records, but there's no real, uh, the same sort of penalty is, is felt by the defendants. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see the courts framing some reasonable budget for the discovery and then saying <coughs> everything beyond that is paid for by the plaintiff. And human nature being what it is, then I think that will lead to uh, more situations where discovery requests are narrowed because the, the plaintiff camp won't want to pay for any more than it absolutely needs to. Um, you know, I, I tried to um, persuade the federal court of that wisdom in a case Ben and I had um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, wasn't it? Well, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't successful. Um, I will continue to try. But, <laughs> but it does seem to me, I mean, as a, as a matter of principle, I think there's some rationality mm -hmm. to that position. I mean, indeed, the federal court's toolbox was a was probably always adequate to do that, but it has been expressly amended to include that particular facility. So, I mean, I, I think that's an area where we really do need to sharpen the focus. Um, Perhaps the focus can be <coughs> sharpened by the defendants agreeing to provide only those documents that damage the defense. <laughs> <laughs> what do I love? What about those that are just plaintiffs? Just another comment. Um, the problem we've got though is we're applying that to, from a defendant's point of view, say to a multinational company that may have thousands of employees um, across a date range or a, a date period which may go for years across multiple systems. So the problem you're trying to tackle is getting bigger and bigger. The technology is sort of keeping pace with it. So. You know, nothing's really changing, we're maintaining a bit of the status quo. And what I wonder is, um, and what I often observe, is that the discovery requests that are made are very, very subjective. And if you were to draw discovery orders in a more objective way, say, uh, specific date ranges, people, departments, document types, for people like myself and Alison, it makes it a lot easier to go off and collect and review that stuff, um, and therefore a lot cheaper, than the subjective requests that are made that are essentially a fishing exercise. Um, so my, my question is really, could we draw uh, discovery requests and categories in a, in a much more objective way? And, and in my view, that would certainly uh, reduce the burden and reduce the cost. There, 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 is, there is one view that <clears throat> um, rather than specific requests from the, the plaintiffs in these cases, because the plaintiffs really aren't in the best position to know what there is to specifically ask for, is to just sit back and say, well, you've got to give standard discovery, and standard discovery is, as I understand it, only those documents that assist the plaintiff's case, damage the defendant's case, directly relevantly um, uh, improve the defendant's case, <clears throat> and otherwise no further fishing to be done. Now, that's putting a burden, a burden back onto the defendant, which is, um, pretty significant, I would have thought. I mean, there are, there are other options. John's mentioned the possibility of deposing um, company executives to identify how the documents are sorted out and therefore enable us to get the categories clearly identified. But also we should, I think in some circumstances, have opportunities where independent um, court appointed experts can be um, enabled to go into the company and to search the databases information um, to come out with um, you know, documents that do those things on the discovery rather than just relying on the defendant to do it. And there may be some cost shifting there. I'm not um, enormously excited about cost shifting, of course, because it means shifting onto my side of the transaction, but uh, there are some circumstances where cost shifting may have to be accepted by us. And the technology would really help um, in that scenario, although I'm sure. Um, that may not be agreed by the, the defendant side of the coin, because if you know there are documents identified um, that are relevant and really critical to the case, then you know, the technology is such that you can throw it back out to the data set and say, "Well, show me any other documents that are like this," and that, that saves an enormous amount of time. And so, if you can find those those critical elements and then say, "Well, you know, what, what's the pool you're looking for here?" That that can really come to the pool. In, uh, 
uh, if there are no further questions on that topic, uh, we move on in, a, in the recent um, reasons for uh, judgment of Justice Gordon in the Montec case, her honour said, and I'm paraphrasing, the court needs experienced, competent, and respected solicitors and counsel to assist it in the settlement approval process. And that's because Section 33B of the Federal Court of Australia Act makes it mandatory for uh, a settlement, a class action, to be approved by the court. I always think when I hear that said, that's a bad way of putting it, that it makes it mandatory for the court to approve. It doesn't, that's the whole point. But you don't get it, there's no approved settlement without the court agreeing. Um, so, the question is, is the pool of practitioners in the class action area uh, too small or should it be widened out? Um, and uh, this is a question that I'd like to get Justin Wheeling to comment upon. Uh, would it be desirable in Australia that we have a wider range of practitioner involved in the class action process? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Yes, uh, Ben made a, a good point before when he said uh, him and his mates uh, are acting on most of the big class actions in Australia. And you're right, that um, your mates down the road at Slater's and and yourself, Ben and Morris Blackburn, have, have, have really got the market almost to yourself. You, you've got Sean Lawyers and David Robertson and, and a few other firms as well that are looking to, to muscle in a bit more. But um, I think it, it makes sense when we have such a competitive market at the moment that you would look for more firms like your Piper Ordinance who tried to launch the vote firm class action to get involved in this area. Um, the returns can be quite good. Um, you're diversifying your client base. I mean, Pipers have just laid off to be resolution staff in their home market in Adelaide. They need alternative sources of income. But the question is, um, they can't, these firms can't do these things half cop. They need to, to build up the capabilities, the book build, and, and get the level of sophistication that, that Ben and his team have, and, and what the Slater and Gordons have as well. And that takes time. So, yes, there is room for more firms to do work in this area. Um, but I think they need to be very careful and strategic about how they go about it. Yeah. We, we, we had a case um, earlier um, I won't name the law firm involved, but um, uh, ben, Ben's firm, I think, ultimately moved in to um, assist a small firm that started a class action, um, a big class action. And uh, uh, I think after many years, got to the point where it, um, it, it felt it wasn't able to take it forward and, and, and called in Morris Blackburn to, uh, to move the matter um, past that point. Um, there's a real issue around access to justice in all this stuff too. I'm, I'm, I'm again a defendant boy talking about this, but sorry, John, was that <clears throat> was that the one that we found out after about a year that they hadn't got instructions from the lead applicant to take the proceeding? I'm not Maybe that one. Yeah, that may be looking. They're asking yeah. pitfalls in these class actions. <laughs> Being instructors is always a good idea. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> write that one down. We we always find it out the position, but anyway, there there is there clearly the worst thing that can happen is the class action starts and and the poor class is left. I think everyone would agree that's not good for the system. The class is left uh, exposed. Um, and that could happen because of the firm runner doesn't have the experience, or it could happen because the funding runs out. Um, funding is the like a lot of class actions, John's firm may not be involved. Um, but there is an access to justice issue. I, I, I would be concerned, um, as a wider professional perspective, about a club developing. I, I support. Gordon's comments in the sense that these things do run well and run by experienced people, but this whole area is for the symptoms and you know, it's got to grow and more people need to move into this area. Um, otherwise, it's, it's a club. Yeah. For, for, from a consumer's, I, I see a funder as a consumer of the civil justice system, and it is unfortunate from a consumer's perspective that the profession has this business conflict issue. The bar doesn't. The bar has uh, first cap rank rule, whereas really, other than William Roberts and some other smaller firms that were wanting to get involved and doing it well, there's really only two firms, and they do it for a reason. We go to them for a reason, and it's because they've resourced, they have the people who have the expertise and the experience, but also they don't have business confidence. 
so that you end up with a tribal issue, which is not necessarily conducive to access to justice, nor is it really um, uh, showing favour on the profession. It, it's, it's clearly an issue that's happened over the last 30 or 40 years in the profession, whereby people cannot get well-resourced firms to take on banks and insurance companies. The insurance companies say to the law firms, if you fund, if you get involved in a class action, we'll take all your files away. And there is real pressure on the partners of the firms to say, I won't do it. And so it is an access to justice issue, absolutely. I think the other concern I have is that there's obviously a lot of debate right now around contingency fees. Um, I personally am completely opposed to them in, in this particular area because uh, I think it'll be, it'll, it'll just turn us into a marriage in, in the 80s and 90s. And we may want well to talk about that. But um, it seems to me that uh, you know, if we do move down that path, um, one of the very worst outcomes would be if it's a change and overnight we had hundreds of people trying to do class actions who never had the experience in the area. Um, and these are really complicated, difficult cases, legally, logistically. I mean, I'm sure Ben will um, uh, agree that there have been a lot of lessons learned by Mike Blackburn over the years if they have run these cases and things you do well and things you don't. Um, on the defendant side, the same thing as well, you just don't have time. But that would be a disaster too, wouldn't it, if you think about all those new players in this incredibly complex area. Um, so, you know, so I mean, I personally hope we don't have contingency fees, but one can see that there is some pressure in that direction. Any comment from the audience on this question of opening up uh, the work uh, for the legal profession, getting more firms involved? My sense is, and I've seen, and I think I have a reasonable basis for this, is that you will have the traditional defendants firms taking on the class actions on the plaintiff side in Sydney within the next two or three years. And I, I agree, John, and I think that's dictated by comments. Um, it's an increasingly competitive and, um, and in many ways a contracting legal market in, in many different areas, and, and there are many firms that have been struggling recently, and they need to diversify their revenue streams. And, and it's something that they have to look at hard, particularly if they're failing in certain areas. And, you know, we've got you know, a lot of really well-regarded uh, firms on the defendant side that have come into the market recently, such as the Queen of Matthew Wells. And so I think it makes sense to look at areas which aren't so competitive and on the plaintiff law firm side. It stands out like a beacon to me at the moment. Mm. Um, the damage with a class section for the target company um, doesn't occur um, only when you get to the point where you've got to pay a settlement or a judgment if the, if the case gets that far. The damage is done on day one when there's an announcement of a class section that affects the share price of the company. And the, the, the studies overseas about the actual impact, but some of the old studies used to have predictions of a 10% depression of the share price during the life of the class section. And in fact, I can remember on AWB um, when the class action was uh, settled, um, it was almost a, a statistically um, perfect example. I think the share price literally jumped 9.8% um, in seconds um, on, on the ASX. So the damage with class actions is this starts on day one with the announcement. The next damage starts is a bit poorly run and you know, have to be able to clear your reputation, incurring all the cost in the defence and so on. And, the, and from the plaintiff's side, the, the disappointment for the class members who might miss out or get a lesser result or, or have the problems. My comment about increasing the restrictions on class actions and being able to start a class action is really not to exclude other plaintiff firms from the small pool from running these actions. It's more about making sure that we actually are running the right sorts of claims as class actions. There's a whole lot of actions out there that can get run as class actions. I'm just not persuaded really class actions are the best vehicle for them. And these are the claims where there's you know, a preponderance of individual circumstances. We only need very, very few things to get across the line to run something as a class action. Um, but cases where there's a lot of different causation issues, a lot of individual damages, problems down the road. Um, I mean, there's a lot of debate right now around the issue of whether 
uh, and there's been a discussion that has circulated recently around whether, for example, uh, claims against institutions that might be brought post the um, the, the commission, the royal commission into into um, institutional abuse, um, should those matters be brought? Are they best brought with class actions? And the, the class actions committee discussed that. And the general view was probably better if there's something to happen. It's better off being a it may be better off being a settlement scheme. Devil's in the detail. Um, then had some views around that. But uh, there are claims like that. Class actions are very, probably very well suited to mass tort circumstances where you have an air crash and everybody in the plane had the same circumstance. You know, they were all in that situation. Um, but you know, product liability claims is a range of problems with running class actions for some of those. The individual circumstances are very difficult. With shareholder claims, it will depend on ultimately where we get to with the causation tests and other bits and pieces. You know, obviously, they run. But I'm just really talking about tightening up and thinking more carefully about the best use of resources and courts resources are limited. And these claims have have a real problem if they're run um, other than in a very well thought through and ordered way. Um, and not everybody applies the same risk profile. The funders, um, I know John in past days has had a significantly high threshold to uh, get over that he's had before he's funded a case. Um, uh, not all funders have that same risk appetite. And indeed, Australia is becoming a very attractive market for international funders to get involved in. And they have very expensive risk appetites, uh, far greater than, than the uh, traditional funders in this market. I mean, Ben said earlier, and I was going to come back to this, this is my segue, that uh, there's not a lot of class action started in Australia. Um, Again, then correct me if I haven't quoted him on that well, but but um, you know it depends on how you run the statistics. But it seems to me that that's actually just wrong. Um, if you look at the American stats that came out last year from the clearinghouse and securities class actions, and I know we're talking a lot about securities, I know we're talking about securities class actions a lot tonight. But um, last year in the US, there were 166 federal class actions run up 9% on the year before, a bit lower than some of the statistical averages, but there's a reason for that linked to the Halliburton decision in the Supreme Court. But 166 federal class actions in the securities area against a population of 310 odd million people. In Australia, um, uh, we have, what, 23 odd million. Um, if there are 12 securities class actions filed a year, that's the same ratio as what's occurring in America. In the last six months, we have had 11 threatened class actions or filed class actions um, in the last six months. Uh, two of those are against the same targets. But there were two latent cases. Um, there were um, uh, one of the cases didn't go forward, and the, the, the QBE matter. Um, Treasury White Estates had two class actions. Um, against it. It doesn't matter. We're looking at 11 threatened or filed class actions in the last six months. Um, I, I think the activity levels are picking up um, and I think it's getting worse. And of course we have this enormous shareholding um, uh, component to our population. Um, some of the ASIC figures, and maybe somebody from ASIC here can correct me, but um, uh, ASIC ASX figures were about 55% of Australians um, participate in the share market directly or indirectly. Um, that's three times the number from 1991. It's twice the number from 1997. So you've got that factor as well. And if you think about the ratios, that the level of threatened or, or run claims in this country, in circumstances where we don't have the incentives from America, we don't have contingency fees, we have adverse cost rules, and we don't have certification. I mean, all of these things come together and suggest to me that we actually are going to see more class actions come, um, and we need to think about the implications of that. So my a long way to back to the early question is, yes, um, I am calling for tighter regulation. I'm not doing it to eliminate new plaintiff firms in the marketplace. I'm doing it because I think we're a bit loose at the moment and it needs to be picked up. 
But I don't think we can look at just the number of claims that uh, is either too many or too little. Um, the laws are there to enable the regulation of markets. The policy is to try and get as much capital as we can into Australia at a reasonable price. So we need laws, theoretically, to protect that market. So whether there's 10 or 20 or 30 cases is really potentially relevant to whether there's been bad behaviour or not. And we do need, I think, to have enforceable laws. And, and, and so from a policy perspective, until we actually, and it's a bit like the civil justice system, until we actually work out, uh, and I think the Productivity Commission is probably going to sort of go down this path, reading a couple of the papers, until we work out how do we get just, quick and cheap in our civil justice system and make the process accountable to those deliverables from a, you know, unfortunately, well not unfortunately, we've had um, comments that not everything of value can be counted. But we could start, I think, counting um, uh, in the civil justice system, not necessarily the number of class actions, but how long things take, how, how, much, how much does it cost, when was the first uh, 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 offer of compromise put in, are there systemic players in the system that just don't settle? Are there people who are, are wide of the mark when it goes to pleadings? Everything that, that, that other areas of society has, um, we've sort of steered clear of in, in, in the legal profession, and particularly in the, in, in the teachers' processes that are paid for by the community. And I think we're going to end up with a lot more pressure in the next five or 10 years from the legislature um, uh, on, 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 on just quick and cheap. And I suppose I've, I've, I've diverted from, from the comments about the number of, of, of class actions. The number of class actions to a certain extent are chosen by the victims in the market. We don't, that IMF, choose the cases that proceed. We go to our clients, the institutions, the fund managers, the trustees, and say, are you angry? And unless they're angry and unless there's an appetite there to have a look at the case and conduct due diligence, we don't look. So it's a, it, to a certain extent, class actions are really a self-regulatory mechanism for the market to put a spotlight on bad behaviour. It's not that they really want compensation, it's that they, 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 get, they got pissed off. Just um, a bit of comment. Um, just talking about the access to the legal system, my understanding is that Queensland doesn't yet have a class action jurisdiction. Is and so, you know, if we've got, and I'm not sure if Queensland's the only one that doesn't have that. But you know, if you have victims in a state that doesn't have that jurisdiction, how you file in New South Wales? Oh, in New South so, Wales. So why exactly. can we so, we have a circumstance where we're funding a claim against the White and Dam. Um, Horace Blackburn is going to conduct the proceedings. Uh, we don't have federal jurisdiction, so the state of Queensland doesn't want to create a, a class action regime. Uh, uh, so we're stuck in um, New South Wales Supreme Court uh, using the class action regime. <coughs> Uh, to, to conduct proceedings of, of an action in negligence against the state of Queensland for thousands of Queenslanders. Um, we haven't yet, as a federation, got to the stage where those procedural laws um, are assisting in resolving these types of disputes. You can't find that. Some misleading and sent me conduct there somewhere along the line. Selling water, I thought we were giving it away. For a product like cooking as windows, you may remember. I do remember. That's another story. Um, well, a question for Ben. Uh, and this was touched on by at least two of the speakers. Do class actions perform a regulatory and deterrent function? Uh, for example, uh, Andrews versus the ANZ Bank in relation to the charging of um, bank fees, uh, shareholder class actions in relation to misleading recipient conduct. And related to that question, do class actions perform a regulatory and deterrent function? Should the regulators, such as ASIC and the ACCC, play a more significant role or any role in relation to privately instituted class actions? Yeah. Um, thanks, Kendall. 
I mean, it's obvious that my bias is going to be on side of the answer being that um, class actions do play a significant role in the public enforcement of, um, of regulation. In, in the shareholder space, it's been for a very long time we've had good laws, the Corporations Act, when it was state, when it was state based, and, <coughs> um, and then when it became federal, it hasn't changed enormously. The 674 existing rule may have changed over time. There have been bits and pieces of changes, but the, um, the um, prescription against misleading or deceptive conduct has been there for a very long time. But was anyone doing anything about it? Well, the ASIC, or before ASIC was ASIC, it was the, um, the NCC, wasn't it? Um, was anything being done? Were companies that weren't allowed to get away with anything? I think they just possibly got away with everything. No one was doing anything. It's not an issue about the number of class actions, it's the enforceability of these laws. Parliament has been passing good laws for quite a long time, in spite of the battles on the floor of the House. We have a very comprehensive regime in a number of areas. The common law, common law in terms of um, the ANZ case that Kevin mentioned then, um, of in penalties, was from the, uh, the beginning, the turn of the last century in the UK has been the same. Did anyone do anything about it? No. Did anyone fight on the penalties issue? No. Did I start looking at it when class actions were around? Yes. Did it take me 10 years to do something about it? Yes. Did I do anything about it? No. Did John Walker do something about it? Yes. Why? Because class actions are litigation funding and we worked through a process where my firm wasn't prepared to spec the bank for his class action on its own because we were, the risks were too enormous. Running on these incredibly complicated cases for 10 or 15 years, being able to charge only our ordinary fees with no uplift, no contingency basis, meant the whole deal was too much for us so we decided not to do it. But luckily, John and his colleagues had a closer look at it and worked out a way of running this case. Would anyone out there, apart from people who work for the banks, and maybe even most of the people who work for the banks, think that it was okay to impose the penalty regime across the board on consumers in Australia and impose those sorts of fees for the penalties that were being imposed. <coughs> that'd, that'd be right. This is unseeming. <laughs> I'm Mr. Prazes. Um, <clears throat> the, there is a very good reason why the community deserves to be able to access the court system to resolve mass disputes. Class actions are enabling that to happen. The regulators are obviously under resourced. I'm, I'm not sure that we want regulators, which is coming back to the beginning of your there's a second question, Kevin. <clears throat> the do we really want regulators to have to take action on every single time there's some corporate wrongdoing in the country? It's going to require assets, I think annual budgets already over three hundred million. Do do our super funds really have to sit back and rely on ASIC to take action? There's $1.3 trillion in superannuation monies in Australia at the moment. Do they really have to sit back and just wait? But the class action world, as one super had us explained from the second reading speech when the class action regime was introduced, because even if the losses are substantial, there isn't any point suing if the cost benefit of that action is going to be such that it's just not the collective values not in there. Now, super funds that get scammed by companies um, like, for example, Multiplex, who clearly did not tell the market how appallingly badly the Wembley Stadium project was going. In fact, they quite clearly lied. They misled the market to get money in to pump up the Wembley Stadium project. It was all lies. It came out, the truth came out, and yet ASIC took them on and fined them $32 million. We took them on and they handed over $140 million. Amcor and Busy, Amcor comes to the regulator and says to the ACCC, oh, they done it. Those people over there, Busy done it with the cardboard box price fixing. Um, Mr. Pratt, God rest his soul, um, is fined $36 million. We took them on and they handed over $120 million. What's fair, what's good? Well, it seems to me that it works pretty well the way things are going. The only problem is exactly just this point. These cases are big, they're complicated, they're hard, they're hard fought, and you really do need to resource them enormously, which means you need a lot of money, a lot of risk, hence where John comes in. In fact, I think the system's not working so badly, and if it wasn't the bleating of the US Chamber of Commerce, um, we wouldn't have to have these 
arguments because it isn't that good. So there. <laughs> 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 Another perspective on that, if I, <laughs> if I may, just briefly. But moving on to the question around do class actions act as a deterrent um, for you know, large corporates, if that's how the question is framed. And the answer is yes, I've been in um, a sufficient number of boardrooms to tell you that they do um, create uh, a lot of um, reflection by the companies who are facing class actions. The question, I think, is the problem. It's not simply enough to say, do they act as a deterrent? I think the issue is, are they acting as an over deterrent? I don't think there is a simple answer to that, and I think you need to look at class actions in their many forms <coughs> to really come to a conclusion. And if you think about you know, the shareholder class actions, there's product liability class actions, um, the environmental class actions, um, a whole range of different areas, and there are different outcomes. But this, there is a concept here that I want to put on the table, which is around over deterrence. Um, and, uh, and we talk about economic theory, and really one of the key things there is around optimal deterrence. To the extent that you want to say that class actions operate as what we call private attorney general theory, that is, regulate, can't regulate everything, class action enforcement acts as a sort of private attorney general, a private ASIC in relation to doing that. A private regulator. Yes, there's some truth to that, but the theory really turns to the idea of optimal deterrence. If the deterrence being felt by the target companies, the corporates, is too strong, it has an impact. It causes over defensive behaviours in relation to the way the companies move forward. Too much deterrence means you lose the entrepreneurial spirit. And yes, I imagine the, the obvious comment back is, well, you know, is that really a problem? Well, it, it is a problem. Uh, too much deterrence means there's a lot of extra precautions, redundancy built into the system to try and, you know, absolutely ironclad the stuff. And again, people on the plain side may say that's as it should be. And that's where I say, think about the style of class action. Maybe that's absolutely right in relation to product liability, I'm not suggesting it is, but you can see it might be stronger there than it might be in relation to other areas. But, but these things do have real meaningful impacts. Um, and, the, and the simple answer saying, oh, well, they've got to follow the law, absolutely right, they've got to follow the law. Um, but not all these, not all of these impressions and, and, and effects and deterrence um, really sound as optimal deterrence in this concept. So I have a problem with a private attorney general concept in, in, in the simple way it's stated sometimes. I, I just think there's a, a, a balance there. What I do see is nervousness in the boardrooms. I think probably a greater degree of nervousness that really needs to be there um, for sensible regulation. And on the regulator side, I mean, the point Ben made about the difference between uh, what ASIC does and what happened with the plaintiff firms on class actions is really quite illuminating. Really, there have been some major differences, and I think um, you know you point to probably West Point as well uh, from um, uh, multiplex. ASIC in multiplex, you know, was focused around a 21 day period. The class actions focused around a 10 month period. ASIC was focused around just Wembley. The class actions focused around three building projects. Um, and, and there are changes there as well. The, the, the other thing that creates a new equation here at this point is what about the class? And, and one interesting observation I think um, I can offer on this point is uh, when you think about shareholder classes, how they've changed over the years. Um, and if you've got the idea that the shareholder class is mums and dads and there's this wonderful justice being achieved um, in all these cases for the mums and dads of the world, I'm not sure that the analysis actually um, allows that conclusion. If you look at the GIO class action, this has been provocative, guys, but if you look at the GIO class action uh, back in the early 2000s, there were many tens of thousands of shareholders who uh, participated in the $98 million settlement after uh, the, the $12, $14 million of law firm. But let's say 
tens of thousands get a hundred million dollars. Fast forward to um, multiplex class action settlement, same sum, hundred million dollars roughly, and the size of the class, well, about a hundred to hundred and twenty. Now are they mums and dads of the world? No, they're instos substantially. And that's what's changed. And I think um, that's a point that there should be some reflection on as well. But for, for John's business model, and I don't criticise IMF for his business model, it's a matter for them. But really, it's a lot easier for John to get institutions with massive shareholdings and just act for them than it is to have to pull and round up many tens of thousands of, of mum and dad investors. Now you can point to exceptions. ANZ Bank fees is, is, is a, a class action where there's obviously investors in there um, in, in the mum and dad category in very large numbers. But there is a pool of major class actions where where uh, Ben's clients are starting to look like my clients. And they are your clients. It's a really interesting <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I, can I, next week, you're going to have your chance in a moment. Uh, um, because the last question I want to put, subject to any that come from the audience, is in fact for John. We probably will sidestep the question and answer that last one. That's all right. <laughs> um, just quick and cheap seems to have become a mantra applicable to the resolution of class actions as well as other forms of proceeding. How do you see those three aims being achieved in the future in the class action proceeding? That is a resolution that is just, quick and cost effective. Mm. Uh, it's, it's always safer to get back into policy rather than uh, process. Uh, and I'll, I'll answer that question as soon as I address the issue there. <laughs> the policy um, of the law in regard to securities cases which has been raised is to make sure we get enough capital at the right price and that it's allocated properly. Now the trouble when you have misinformed markets is that the capital goes to the wrong spot. It goes to the guy who oversells his story or whatever it is, and he takes it away from the guy who should get it, or he can't get it, or it's, it's more costly because of the money lost in the market as a result of this fraud on the market, let's call it that. So, so whether it comes through A&P or Perpetual or Jimmy down the road, it all comes from mums and dads. This, it's, it, I think it's a it's wrong to suggest that the rights of big guys are different to the rights of mums and dads. They get their, big guys get their money from mums and dads. They just pull it and put it into the market through what's meant to be efficient processes, the financial services sector. So, so my sense is that as a matter of policy, there is no difference in, in the real problem with funding is that it's an inclusive, it's not an inclusive process. We end up choosing or creating awareness and, and as many people as we can and trying to get them involved. The problem for institutions that don't get involved is that they end up, someone comes and says, well, where's my check? Because they didn't get involved. And so to a certain extent, there is this, you know, well, we have to be involved. And I think that that needs to be addressed as a matter of policy um, to, to make it an inclusive process. So far as the civil justice system, I think we've gone through a lot of the issues tonight. So just quickly on that, um, from, from a, I, I see funders as consumers of the civil justice system, sophisticated, systemic, uh, like banks and insurers. Um, we're just on different sides of, of, of the equation. We all want a, a just, quick and cheap uh, process. Uh, I'm not... Um, after 30 odd years in looking and being involved in the system, wedded to that adversarial process. I think that, it, that globally, um, the adversarial process will tend uh, to become, to, to be dumbed down. I don't think the Rolls-Royce um, delivery of, of really good results uh, for the one out of 10 that can afford to get into the court uh, is gonna be justified uh, because the other nine aren't counted. The, 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 the lack of justice for the people who can't get into the system need to be married as a matter of policy 
for the people who do are able to get in front of the judge at the end of the day and resource themselves to have justice. So, so my sense is that the civil justice system will uh, focus less on trials. We, as professionals, get matters ready for trial. Um, that's the way the system is created. And yet 93 odd percent of cases don't get to trial, or certainly don't get to judgment. So my sense is, is that in just quick and cheap, we will end up uh, bringing it forward by focusing on resolution. What do we need both parties to understand about their positions so that we can uh, at least deliver more justice to more people, uh, have, have, have the system um, having an open door policy uh, which doesn't exclude people who can't afford it. Um, and for the people who can afford it, um, I think the focus then becomes on the quick and the cheap. Now, nobody wants to dumb things down. Nobody wants to uh, have bad justice. That's, that's clearly not, um, as a matter of policy, uh, good for the community. But my sense is that the trend will be, over time, uh, towards a, a less adversarial process. It, it probably will be the legislature that um, uh, delivers this change um, uh, and that uh, tribunals and, and uh, ombudsmen and, and other processes outside the civil justice system uh, are likely to be used more often. Well now, are there any questions from the audience before we bring the um, seminar and the discussion to an end. So that's a question, John. Um, how do you resolve issues when your class of people your class of people in the litigation have different ideas on the instructions to you as the funder? So contractually we deal with the issue on the basis that the representative provides the instructions where there are uh, it's appropriate we have committees to provide the instructions. But predominantly, the common issues of fact and law are a communal uh, benefit for the benefit of the whole class. So in a large sense, the specific circumstances of the, of the specific uh, class members don't really get to, to that stage uh, until the common issues of fact and law are resolved. So as a matter of contract, we say, uh, it differs. On the Wivenhoe Dam case, we give uh, uh, management control to a committee. So there's an appointment of people uh, from the institutions or the insurers or the uh, 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 people who have been flooded. So that there is a cross section. We did that in Pan Pharmaceuticals. But where there is a dispute about the settlement, which is the real ethical issue, I think, uh, uh, we leave it to the um, a senior council to resolve. So we don't have final say. If there is a dispute, then it's up to senior council as to whether or not the matter should resolve. We have only in 170 odd cases sought to have that clause relied on once. Just before I hand the microphone to John for a, a final comment, any further questions or comments from the audience? Yes, yes, Dave. I've got a couple of very modest panel members here. Uh, there's been a bit of discussion tonight about what's happening in the area and the, uh, 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 the club um, of people who are practicing in class actions, but of course there are plenty of other people who are getting exposure to uh, class actions either as potential plaintiff lawyers or defendant lawyers. Um, I've chaired the Law Council's Federal Court Liaison Committee now for nearly 20 years and I'm very proud of the fact that um, that work that's been done by people like uh, uh, Ben and uh, John and other members of the committee has culminated in a thing called the uh, Federal Court Case Management Handbook, which uh, received the imprimatur of the Chief Justice two years ago when it was launched and tries to bring together best practice and procedure commentary in the Federal Court. It's not a substitute for books that look at rules and it's not a substitute for, for books that deal with substantive law. But the chapter that is about to be launched and which is workshopped with the court last year uh, and is now with the editorial committee that comprises um, uh, Kevin Linger and John Sheehan and um, Simon Daly has been prepared largely by John and Ben and it captures what, uh, what we believe, certainly in launching the chapter, is uh, 
best practice in the conduct of class actions in the federal court. It's a collection of the wisdom of a whole range of people about how these things are best run. And if you are getting into the area or if you're interested in, uh, in, that, in that area of practice, then uh, when this chapter hits the deck, as it will very shortly, I commend it to you. As indeed I commend to you the, um, the handbook generally. Some of you may know that judges are now referring to the handbook and, and uh, perhaps castigating might be too strong a word, but talking to practitioners about the fact that they're adopting practices that uh, could be um, uh, improved just by reference to that handbook. And the final reason for mentioning it, uh, and it's not to suggest, by the way, despite the enormous hours that they've given that John and Ben might shortly under the new system become Sir John and Sir Ben. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the final reason for mentioning it is that the handbook is really, as I just said a minute ago, intended to capture the uh, experience of practitioners in the federal court and to represent best practice. Parts of it are now some two years old, and Colin, wherever he is from a, a minute ago, is obviously practicing in this area may have something to say about the class actions chapter when it's launched, but if you as practitioners uh, otherwise wish to comment on the handbook or have something to contribute, please do so. And as I've said, uh, Kevin Lingren, I think you're the chair of the editorial committee. Uh, John Sheehan, I think. John Sheehan is the chair. But in any event, there is an editorial committee that would be very pleased to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks very much and for that. Tony Jones would have said that was a comment, not a criticism. <laughs> <laughs> um, well now, uh, yes, John Henry will be too modest to say what I'm about to say. I've seen the chapter and read through it. I think it is the best um, possible commentary one could imagine on class actions in the federal court in every way. Um, practical, um, comprehensive. It contains uh, some precedents. Uh, it's got a good dose of scholarship. Uh, it is just simply first class, and I really do com uh, compliment John and Ben on producing a fine piece of work. And as David said, it should see the general light of day uh, in a week or two, I hope. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think both Ben and I would acknowledge that there have been a, a number of other people, both of our firms, who have been involved in this. Certainly, my in, Michael Legg, and, and there have been a number of colleagues assisting. So. Thank, thank you for all that. My, my last comment was really around your question on governance uh, of class actions, and I just just a couple of thoughts there. Um, uh, the US do it quite differently from, from over here, um, and John's referred to a governance committee for the, the Queensland floods class action, um, which is not the normal model. Um, in America, it is. There are governance committees with representation by a whole range of um, shareholder or uh, investor or product liability affected uh, or product affected or environmental affected persons. What the class action is, is a representative pool put together to uh, guide the class and make sure of all the relevant interests. A little bit like a committee of inspection in the insolvency, um, a little bit like a board of directors in a company, a little bit variations. And indeed, um, in America, um, these committees often have separate legal counsel to the counsel who is acting in the class action. And that is to make sure that there is um, more than one set of eyes talking about what is in the best interests of the class. Uh, the reason there is because the, the firm acting has a contingency fee, so that's a greater motivation. But I think there's some interesting lessons to be picked up from America around the governance structure and certainly if there was a reform of the laws, that would be one of the areas I would be you know, asking the government to uh, make some changes around. The other thing they do in America is uh, in securities litigation, um, you can't just put up any mum or dad to be the plaintiff in these actions. Um, the position is that uh, the party with the largest interest in the matter, so usually the largest shareholder, or it can be a group that get together to uh, between them constitute the largest financial interest, um, they get to be the plaintiff in the action. And that adds a whole different dynamic to the cases. Uh, because when a real large inst institution is running the action, briefing the lawyers, driving the process, um, it's tended to lead to better earlier outcomes in the litigation and more selection around what's run and what's not run. Uh, but it's a whole range of governance issues. You've, you've sort of opened a door there that could go in a whole of rather directions, um, uh, and they will control 
funders fee as well if there is a funder involved. Um, and that's a, a, again another wide area as well. Our funders fee is too high. John sidestepped that quickly tonight because I didn't raise it earlier. Um, you know, we could go in a whole range of we punts here. We could <laughs> homework. But governance is a huge issue for us going forward. It's got to be dealt with. I think um, Ben's side of the, of the floor may say there's no issues there. I hear John's experience about the only one debate in 170 odd cases. Um, but I think it's because they haven't had the experience of the alternative system. Uh, anyway, my final comment. Thanks, John. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that does bring the evening to a conclusion, although I think you're invited to stay on for eat some drinks. But um, would you please just join with me in thanking our panel members, all of them, for the great contribution that they've made tonight. Um, they're all uh, very competent in this area, and I think that uh, they've really treated us uh, very well. Thank you.